palette full of color We'll leave the truth uncovered Cause all these lies are white We use the words we write To shine a light on life My light is lava like It's hot and burning bright now read Hey everybody welcome back to And Scene I'm Cynthia Dorsey And I'm very neat Lachelle Mac Ray Thank you for coming in the room with us today. Today we are going to jump right on in. We will be reviewing Lynn Nottage's play, Poof. So Lynn Nottage is a playwright and a screenwriter, and she's actually still the only woman to have won two Pulitzer Prizes in drama. Um, she's currently an associate professor for the Department of Theater at Columbia University in New York, and she was a student in, and gained her skills under Brown University and Yale School of Drama. Um, some other things to know about Lynn Nottage that she's actually the co-founder of a production company called um, Market Road Films. And one of their most recent projects is The Notorious Mr. Bout. Um, she has a plethora of pieces that are not only produced in the United States, but across the world, including pieces like Ruined, Intimate Apparel, By the Way, Meet Vera Stark. Um, and of course, what we're going to talk about today, Poof. Um, she just a phenomenal contributor to drama and the pieces that she crafts together, especially today with Poof. If you want to learn more about her, she actually has a website directly about her. It is lynnnottich.com where you'll be able to learn more about her, her background, um, her plays, and the other works that she has produced and are currently in production for. So now we will jump into her piece today, Poof. Yes, Poof is only about a dozen, a dozen pages. It's a short yes. play, easy read, funny. I, so I would highly recommend it. I loved it. Just a little brief synopsis on Poof. Um, the play takes it on the issues of domestic violence um, and the psychology of a, of a victim. Uh, we are met with a couple um, Samuel is the husband, and Laureen is the wife. And Samuel and Laureen are having a conversation, and Samuel is abusive to Laureen. They're having uh, their tit-for-tat conversation, and then poof, Samuel blows up, combusts into ashes. Um, she calls her best friend, Florence, who lives upstairs, and she's trying to explain to Florence the entire play about how Samuel is now a pile of ashes on the floor. These mystical elements with real life social issues is what mm -hmm. makes this piece powerful. What did you think about it? Um, I loved that approach that she took with like how you're calling it the mystical elements um, with a extremely serious subject matter. I think it brought a sense of, of comedy and humor while still being authentic to what it was speaking about and making sure that that wasn't um, hidden or, or brushed aside, but it was highlighted. You know, we're looking at these, both women as we read and we find out are both in abusive relationships. And through that kind of mystical element and the humor that's in there, you know, she doesn't just glance over, but she dives straight in to an issue that is still prevalent. I don't have the statistics, you know, directly in front of me, but unfortunately domestic violence um, and abusive relationships reign all the way from teenage relationships all the way up into, you know, senior ages. And um, it's something that unfortunately has always been around, whether it was, um, and even though we see it mainly with men being abusive, you know, to women as highlighted in this play, we know it, it exists both ways. Um, but even during the pandemic and COVID-19, one of the things that they've been saying is how where, you know, you're home, you're quarantined, you're quarantined with your abuser. Um, so the thing that I really was intrigued about with is how she just finally speaks up, you know, and, and poof, he's gone. Uh, but what would that be like? What is that sense of what do you do with yourself if you are finally free from your abuser? And 
I really was drawn by the contrast between her and um, between Lorene and Florence. Yeah. Because Lorene was free. And as she's trying to explain it to Florence throughout, Florence is not free. Right. Um, Florence is still in her relationship. Florence still has to return upstairs, you know, per the end of the conversation. And um, that really stood out to me. Yeah, um, I I really like um, an insight, the insight um, Lynn Nottage gives us on the housewife at that time. Um, seeing this idea of being seen but not heard, only seen when your husband wants you to be seen, um, only speaking when spoken to, is a is the type of feel you get just based on the dialogue between Lorraine and mm-hmm. Florence. Um, Florence really is um, in the middle of dinner. Her husband is expected to be home at any right. moment. In fact, in the play, she says a lot, I got a pot of rice boiling and you didn't call me down here for this. Like she's like really focused on how to get her household. She has children upstairs. She wants to get her household settled for the evening. And she doesn't want to necessarily have to deal with Loreen and Samuel's dispute. Um, she's just, she just seems afraid of what her husband, um, will say if she's downstairs when he comes down. Even though we've seen like structures change and based on the portrait of, like you said, with the housewife, it seems like that this would be maybe dated some. It's, it's really not. You'll still find and hear about couples and interactions where, they feel like this is supposed to be the structure where that kind of patriarchal kind of role and the submissive role of the wife or the woman is still present. So you'll see sometimes there's conflicts because people will go into relationships um, with two different perspectives. And like, I felt bad. I felt so bad for Florence who was like, you know, you're calling me down here, but I know I have to have X, Y, Z done. And He's wondering why I can't keep the house clean like you keep your house clean. Right. And, and if I don't have this done, I know there's a realm of consequences coming for me. Um, and you felt that through her character. And then you also felt her trying to help um, Lorene discern what really happened. And then there was even that moment, you know, where it's like, if Samuel's really gone, you left me, you know? Mm-hmm. You left me behind. I'm still in this. You might be free, but I got to get back upstairs because nothing has changed for me right. except now I don't have you right there to relate to what I'm going through. Right. Absolutely. Um, so this play has only three characters and Samuel is in it for like a millisecond. And yeah. it is written <laughs> mainly with the dialogue between two female characters, uh, Lorraine and Florence, as we mentioned before. The set is minimal, so the author lets us know that um, there should just be a kitchen and a pile of ashes. Those are the two very simple, minimalistic um, a note for set. Um, and then costumes say modern. So I think you're absolutely right, Veronique, in that um, she intended for this particular piece to transcend time. Um, so it should be applicable to whatever decade or year it is being produced, which is as a as a writer myself i feel like that is that gives your piece a different type of legacy right Mm -hmm. so that it it is a period piece for the period you're in it takes thought process to do that and lots Mm -hmm. of 
preparation and planning. And I really appreciate that because unfortunately, we're living in a world where domestic violence doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And you know right. that, you know, um, but to have a piece that will mold to whatever state the world is in is a legacy beyond like that's forward thought on legacy period right um so i appreciate that about it yeah, i think I, I i totally agree because sometimes you can see a play and you're like it's a good piece or yeah that was happening then but to be able to have a work that can cross decades and cross you know mm -hmm. cross cultures because domestic violence isn't limited to one culture or one ethnicity you know yeah. you find it across the board and sometimes it's integrated into the culture you know there are some cultures and religious practices that say that is the way it's supposed to be and if that woman does not do what you say you are supposed to, mm -hmm. to you know to hit almost beat into submission or reprimand and you know in a physically abusive way um and then what i do love about it was that it was so short so like you said earlier you know that dozen pages but i can I can really make a point and hit home with a piece that's not long, but has long impact. Right. Um, and so it will be one of those pieces, if you produced it, it would be great to be like in support of other nonprofits or things where you can have panel discussions or you can see and get more insight where people can share um, because both characters exhibit, you know, that's the thing I love about the characters outside of the, the mystical component of him just disappearing into ashes these ladies are real ladies mm -hmm. and and maybe it wouldn't be that he disappeared into ashes you know like in real life maybe he had a heart attack or right. maybe he got you know locked up but what do you do with yourself because also for a lot of people you can know something is not good for you right but it's what you know mm -hmm. so now you have the ring she has to call her friends i was i was just here and and he's gone Mm -hmm. What do I do? And then she was feeling some guilt um, yeah. a little bit in there. Like, well, I should call his mother. Or I his should do such and such. <laughs> right. And I'm like, this man was abusive. To, and, and you still feel guilt. Well, I should let his mom know. Because, we, you know, as people still wrestling with those things, right? Some people be like, oh, well, she's free. She should be doing cartwheels and dances. But this is still the life that she knew. When I was younger, um, and I can't get too detailed because um, if somebody watched it related to me, they would know. But it's not familial ties. But, you know, I was witness to a relationship that had children and the man was very physically abusive. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was um, maybe 10 or 11. And uh, one of the kids in that family, we were the same age. So we talked and we hung out a lot and stuff. But just to see you know, how the mom was and then the, the mom who interacted with our family just trying to be free but not knowing and went back so many times. Went back time after time. After, because you might know it's not right, but it's like, what, this is the life I know. Um, so just to see that um, within the script and how, like you said, she's able to capture it. And it's um, a timeless capturing. It, it get and and I like that minimalistic set. I like you know the the simplicity of it, so that you could focus on this on the story of it, and focus on the words of the characters, and see the feelings. Um, I've always loved minimalist sets, but I think that's one of the things I because then you're not trapped in all of the spectacle, which is wonderful in musicals and different things, but it's something about stripping away and just getting to the heart of what yeah. um, is being said by the performers. And I think that that works really well with this piece and it also lets this piece have the ability to travel. Yeah. You know, I could have four tables and a chair and a pile of ashes and a broom and yeah. still do this show. So. Yes. The work is left to the actor. It really is. It's no props. It's no set pieces that will help you tell your story. You have to tell the story. So the actors have to be on their game to make sure this goes off without a hitch. Uh, Veronique and I both are independent directors and producers. And so we produce shows and films. And from the time I read this and 
I sat down and thought about the many budgets that the both of us have had <laughs> in the course of our careers. I'm just like, this play would not cost me that much. Like, I was right. you know saying, and I was just so like, after, um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I like it. It, it will not cost me that much. You're right. It, it could um, be focused on, um, you know, giving back to organizations that help women in the domestic abuse situations. I could see so many things that could come of this. So if you are looking for a piece, if you're a director, um, as well as actors, but mainly directors and producers, if you're independent and you're looking for um, small budget uh, win, then this might be the piece for you to look into. So we have the phenomenal Karen Lawrence coming yeah. in today. And we are so excited to hear what she has to say about her career and to get this cold read with uh people. yes, yes. Look forward <laughs> to her killing this, okay? <laughs> Hello, everybody. We are here with Karen Lawrence. Hi, Karen. Hey, hey Karen. Hi. Hey. I'm so happy that you are here. I had the privilege of working with Karen back in 2018 or 17. Um, she was in the production I directed of In the Blood. She's a phenomenal actress with a long <laughs> things on her resume, so I'm pretty sure you guys will benefit from what she has to say about the industry. Karen, I know you've done children's theater, uh, web series, adult theater, um, out of, you've even written things. How, what would you say is your favorite modality of performance art? Ooh, um, <laughs> definitely a good question. I'll say definitely performing. Um, I would, I'd say I had the most experience with doing adult plays, but um, I've had the opportunity to work with children's theater with Callaloo um, using puppets, and that was so much fun engaging with kids and also um, learning a whole different art form of puppetry. Um, it looks easy uh, when people do it or on Sesame Street, but really you have to have that arm strength. So that's, and <laughs> you have to make sure you're moving the head right so the eyes align. So that was cool. Um, I would say that would be my second favorite, but first favorite, definitely um, adult plays, theater plays. So what, uh, what is one of the most recent plays that you have worked on most recently? Um... I would say No Exit. That was November-ish of last year with Live Garrett Theater Company. It's um, a Black-owned theater company in Silver Spring, Maryland. And um, the artistic director, who is um, Wanda, she uh, loved the play No Exit and wanted to do it. Um, and it was a, an interesting, it was a good experience because that play in itself is really challenging. And I think it really stretched me as an actor and my castmates, um, it also stretched them. And there were some interesting elements of chemistry um, amongst us cast members too. So that was a, an unforgettable experience, I'll say, but definitely one of growth. That sounds kind of, you know, edge of the Feet right there, some interesting. <laughs> <laughs> some interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, when you are doing theater, what is your process? Are you a process based actor? Um, I know that you have lot. You've taken lots of coursework. Um, you were in the con theater lab honors conservatory. Uh, do you think that that's beneficial to your process? Oh, definitely. I'm actually in it uh, right now. We are, I guess, halfway through um, since it's June, and I've learned so much since being in it. And even how to um, 
structure my rehearsals because we have to do scenes like so far we've done about two scenes with the scene partner and um we have to meet up to rehearse those things and we take other classes that require outside work and um so we go over like how to audition and um how to prepare a monologue for audition how to prepare scenes and different exercises to do in the rehearsal process to um move your scene forward. And the instructors who are um, Buzz Mauro, Deb Godesman, and Kim Schraff, they are very talented and just awesome instructors. And I'm so glad to be able to learn from them and glean from them because they have a lot of experience um, between them. And they just like attract wonderful people and awesome faculty at the theater lab. So it's been amazing and I'm learning so much. Um, what would you share with uh, probably upcoming actors? Sometimes um, when interacting with other actors, you'll hear people say, oh, I naturally have it, or they're not as invested in developing their craft. Mm -hmm. What would you say when it comes to that training and the education component to the profession? I would say training education is very important, but at the same time, it shouldn't be a barrier. I, I've wanted to take acting classes for a while. I took some here and there, but I wasn't able to go through a program like this because acting classes cost money and some of them are really expensive. But thankfully, because I have a full-time job, um, I, got, I was able to save up money and do this program and uh, make the payments. So because of that, I think that's a very... A really good benefit and um, a, a privilege to be able to take classes and I think if somebody has the opportunity to take an acting class they definitely should because you learn so much more and while raw talent is definitely valid I think um, having some instruction or at least a guide of uh, or some kind of method of what to do and um, knowing some of the basics like actions, objectives, um, motivations, things like that can definitely help enrich an actor's work and take them pretty, pretty far. And I know that there are some celebrities who never studied acting formally, but I believe even they even get some acting coaching. So I encourage anybody who's an upcoming or aspiring actor to, if they can, try to get some kind of coaching or take a class. Um, I know there are some like low cost webinars. I think there have been some free um, Zoom classes um, during this pandemic. I'm not sure how many are there are anymore. But even if you know somebody else who is an actor or a director, if you can get a little bit of their time to um, perform a monologue in front of them or something to get some feedback, even that's helpful. Because before I started these um, classes, I went to a friend of mine who is a professional actor in the DC area and had a couple of sessions with him and he helped me greatly with a monologue that I wanted to audition with and share with me some things that he learned from his training. So even that was um, very helpful for me. What would you say um, the state of the entertainment industry is right now specifically pertaining to black women as you continue to pursue your career? The state of the industry, I think it's better, COVID notwithstanding, <laughs> but um, because we're seeing more and more roles for us and by us, uh, my favorite person to look to is Issa Rae. I love her so much because I watched her Awkward Black Girl web series when it was like first out back in what 2014, I think. And then I watched her show Insecure. Um, she's making roles in the space for black women, David DuVernay, of course, and um, so many coming up in Hollywood. And in, even in theater, there are a lot of black women playwrights, although I think it's still a struggle. We still have a long way to go to get parody on the stage and even in Hollywood, but it's better than it was. Um, because not only do we have more roles, but we have more diverse roles where we're not always the, the girlfriend of the drug dealer or the unpleasant black woman, you know, there are shades and layers to 
the characters and the roles available to us. But there could be more, of course. <laughs> what would be your ideal, if there is one, um, probably performing or acting goal for you within these next few years? Of course, COVID withstanding, since we don't know how things are quite shaping right now for mm -hmm. us in entertainment. Um, but kind of where is your, maybe like the horrid question of your five-year plan or where, where do you see yourself with your, your art? I would love to be um, performing full-time, um, not having to have a nine to five, but um, being able to get consistent work on stage, but also in film and even television. Um, right now, film, uh, Sorry, stage is where I have the most experience and where I still want to develop, but I also aspire to be an, an EGOT, I guess, without the Grammy. But yeah, stage, television, film, um, even voiceovers too. I want to do it all. <laughs> no limits. No limits. No limit no actor. I don't know. <laughs> That didn't work. <laughs> that's, that's amazing, though, because I think sometimes, like, sometimes people will have focus, but then also knowing that you can develop your talent and then take it to another place and another place, and it makes those opportunities limitless for you. Um, some people are like, I solely want to do this, and they know that. And there are others who are like, I know I have these multiple things within. So it's, you know, it's always awesome and refreshing to hear with say, no, you know what? No, I'm going to get that ego. Oh, you didn't know I sing? Wait, the G will come later. I'm going to work right. on it right now. And, you know, but just to, to, to know that, that, that vision and that goal, so the importance of developing, like you said, and continuing to work and knowing, you know, I want to get this and achieve that and the, the types of roles I see wanting to see more, but it, even us having those, visuals and those people out there now that we say yes we can have that goal when it wasn't always like that so i think it's i think it's awesome i'll, I'll be there clapping and cheering because i know you will get it so not a if it's a win <laughs> yes absolutely do you think that um it's important for actors to um build relationships with directors and people in the industry other than other actors um how are you doing that if so definitely and that is one area in which i need to work on um because in general networking is hard for me because i'm an introvert but i definitely think building relationships with directors and producers and anyone involved in a production is important because you don't know who they know or if you might not be the right fit right now for their project. They can keep you in mind later on. And I do have a, um, yeah, a few directors that I've worked with and have relationships with and um, some are in school right now because um, they're trying to also better their careers. But uh, we have a long lasting friendship and we agree like when the time comes, we'll get together to collaborate on more projects. Um, and that's definitely important building that community. Um, and even if it's somebody who, um, I've heard stories of someone who befriended somebody who was um, a crew member on a film, um, might have remembered them or referred them to a higher up. So I think it's, networking is definitely important because somebody will, will remember you at some point. What's your favorite player film? Oh my gosh. My favorite play. Uh, I don't know why I'm blinking right now, but um, one of my favorite films is the musical Sound of Music because I love <laughs> I love the singing in there um, and the acting as well. Um, another musical, Carmen Jones, um, with uh, Dorothy Dandridge and Harry Belafonte. Favorite, two of my favorites, and I promise I have some non-musical favorite films. I just can't think of them right now. Um, um, I recently read, um, I'm not, probably gonna not pronounce this right, Warriors of Venus by Lydia Diamond. I really like that play. 
um, it was basically about Sarah Bartman and then another character in present day also named Sarah and her um, intertwined relationship with that character. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I really like that one. Okay. There are some <laughs> How do you prepare for a cold read? And has there ever been a time you did a cold read that just tanked? <laughs> yes. Um, how I prepare for a cold read, usually if I get the script with like a couple of minutes, I'll try to skim over the lines um, and read the character I'm supposed to be reading for um, to try to get like the, the tone of the script. And... Yes, there have been some cold reads that I have tanked on, even if I got the script like in advance. There was an audition for, I believe, Constellation Theater Company um, that I, I really didn't have the whole context of the play. And so I tried to do my best and try to do some movements with the script, but it just quite didn't work. And I think I didn't have a good enough feel of the character. So definitely didn't get a call back for that one, but it was a learning experience as all of them are. Okay. Well, Karen, we are going to challenge you to do a cold read today. We are reviewing the play Poof by Lynn mm -hmm. Nottage. Have you heard of that one? I have. I actually read it a, a long time ago, so. Yeah, it'll be cold. <laughs> I, like, I remember I liked it, though. Okay, um, we're going to ask you to read for Lorene. And, Veronique, you want to read for Florin? Or do you want me to read you? I do? Okay. And, yeah, we're going to read from 94 to the top of 90 nine where Loreen has the last line. I'm sorry for Okay. Ready, Karen? Yes. Okay. Hey. Uh, uh, uh. You all right? What happened? Smells like you burned something. What the devil is that? Samuel. It's Samuel, I think. What's he done now? It's him. It's him. Child, what's wrong with you? Did he finally drive you out your mind? I knew something was going to happen sooner or later. Dial 911, Florence. Why? You're scaring me. Dial 911. I think I killed him. What? I killed him. I killed Samuel. Come again? He's dead, dead? Nah, stop it. I don't have time for this. I'm going back upstairs. You know how Samuel hates to find me here when he gets home. You're not going to get me this time. Y'all can have y'all little joke. I'm not part of it. Did you really do it this time? I don't know how or why it happened. It just did. Why are you whispering? I don't want to talk too loud. Something is liable to disappear. Where's his body? There. You burned him? I don't know. I think so. Either you did or you didn't. What you mean you don't know? We're talking murder, Lorraine, not oven settings. You think I'm playing? How many times have I heard you talk about getting rid of him? How many times have we sat at this very table and laughed about the many ways we could do it 
And how many times have you done it? None. A pair of cheap spectacles. That's all that's left. And you know how much I hate these. You ever seen him without them? No. He counted to four and disappeared. I swear to God. I don't bring the Lord into this just yet. Sit down now. What you got to sip on? I don't know whether to have a stiff shot of scotch or a glass of champagne. He was... Take your time. Standing there. And? He exploded. Did that motherfucker hit you again? No, he exploded. Boom, right in front of me. He was shouting like he does, being all colored. And then he raised up that big crusty hand and hit me. And poof, he was gone. I barely got words out and I'm looking down at a pile of ash. Child, I'll give you this. In terms of color, you've matched my husband, Edgar, the story king. He came in at thick Sunday morning, talking about he'd hit someone with his car and had spent all night trying to outrun the police. I felt sorry for him. It turns out he was playing poker with his paycheck, no less. You don't want to know how I found out, but I did. You think I'm lying? I certainly hope so, Lorene, for your sake and my heart. Samuel always said if I raised my voice, something horrible would happen. And it did. I'm a witch. The devil spawned. You've been watching too much television. Never seen anything like this on television. Wish I had, then I know what to do. There's no question. I'm a witch. Child, don't tell me you've been messing with the mojo women again. What did I tell you? He's not coming back. Oh no, how could he? It would be a miracle. Two in one day, I could be canonized. Worse yet, he could be. All that needs to happen now is for my palms to bleed and I'll be eternally remembered as St. Laureen, the patron of battered wives. Women from across the country will make pilgrimages to me, laying pies and pot roasts at my feet and asking the good saint to make their husbands turn to dust. How often does a man like Samuel get damned to hell and go? You smoking crack? Do I look like I am? Hell, I, I seen old biddies creeping out of crack houses talking about they were doing church work. Lawrence, please be helpful. I'm very close to the edge. I don't know what to do next. Do I sweep them up? Do I call the police? Do I... Oh, God. You gonna let it ring? No! What if it's his mother? She knows. I should be mourning. I should be praying. I should be thinking of the burial, but all that keeps popping into my mind is what will I wear on television when I share my horrible and wonderful story with the studio audience? He made me a killer, Florence. And you remember what a gentle child I was? I'm a killer. I'm a killer. I'm a killer. I wouldn't throw that word about too lightly, even in jest. Talk like that gets around. You think they'll lock me up? A few misplaced words and I'll probably get the death penalty. Isn't that right? Isn't that what they do to women like me, murderers? Folks have done time for less. Thank you. Just what I needed to hear. What did you expect? That I was going to throw up my arms and congratulate you? Why'd you have to go and lose your mind at this time of day? While I got a pot of rice on the stove and Edgar's about to walk in the door and wonder where his goddamn food is. And, 
and, and he's going to start in on me about all the nothing I've been doing during the day and why I can't work. And then he'll mention how clean you keep your home. And I don't know how I'm going to look him in the eye without. I'm sorry, Florence. Really, it's out of my hands now. And see. Yay! How do you feel? How do you feel? I feel like I was like edge of sea. <laughs> How do you feel? That was fun. Um, my heart was beating kind of fast. I'm like, oh my gosh! I was trying to like get the stage directions and all that. Uh huh. But it was fun. Yeah. Awesome. I think um, it's very important for us to have monologues and roles to play. And yes. that's why we are like evaluating um, these plays written by women of color to see if women of color are writing us. Um, mm -hmm. And so we thank you so much for sharing in this journey with us by coming on and interviewing on and scene and we know that your career is going to go to new heights because you're Thank gifted, you. you're talented, you are empathetic and humble and we are so grateful that we know you. Thank you. I'm grateful as well. Thank you for having me on the show. It's so good to talk with you guys again and see you again. It definitely is. Yeah. This is wonderful. And thank you again for making this space for actresses of color, black actresses. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Like Bye, Kim. Bye.